Hello, YouTubers, friends, compatriots. Who left your shells? Don't slay stars, peasants, vassals, geopolitical fans. I'm a useful idiot, and today I want to talk about preventive war and or preemptive war. And, uh, of course, the reason I want to talk about this is, is as uh, in the post-9-11 world, it is now part of U.S. foreign policy. And uh, we had a preventive slash preemptive war against Iraq. We've seen it again in the NATO operation against Libya. Now there's potential that we will have another preventive, preemptive war against Iran. And uh, let's look at the difference first between a preventive war and a preemptive war, because it's a fine line indeed in some ways. I mean, uh, preemptive war is launched with the thought that there is going to be immediate aggression from another country, and. Uh, so that is a preemptive war. And so for us to call the uh, uh, invasion of Iraq a preemptive war is misleading. It's more of a preventive war. And it's not really even that. But uh, let's just say for argument's sake that it is a preventive war. And that is to destroy the potential of an en enemy even when a threat is not imminent or there is no known plan. And uh, so that clearly makes it a little, um, a little more dubious have a preventive war, uh, which is more common uh, when there's no immediate threat. And uh, that brings up, you know, the pitfalls of uh, a preemptive war, particularly, or a preventive war, and that is uh, usually they're associated with a false flag event. And, um, for example, in Vietnam, we were already involved in the war, but then the Tonkin Gulf incident happened, or as in the case may be, didn't happen. And uh, it was used as a excuse to amp up our war effort in Vietnam, but that's technically not a uh, not anything to do with a preemptive or a preventive war. This is an example of a false flag incident. So uh, let's get into some historical examples of uh, what we're talking about here: preemptive and or preventive wars. Um, two really good examples are Japan invaded northern China the area known as Manchuria, and renamed it Manchuko in 1931. And uh, this so-called uh, preemptive strike was uh, started by the Mukdan incident. Japan claimed to be fighting a defensive war. Does that sound familiar? Um, they they uh, invaded Manchuria, but were claiming they were fighting a defensive war in Manchuria, attempting to preempt a supposedly aggressive move by the Chinese. And... Um, so a bridge was blown up, and uh, the Japanese, of course, accused the Chinese of doing it. But as it turns out, as always, it was the Japanese who blew it up to justify this expansion of their presence in Manchuria. And um, an interesting story in itself. I'll attach a link below so you can read more about that incident. It's pretty fascinating. And then uh, it also turns out that the uh, Gleibitz incident, where Germany claimed that uh, there was an imminent invasion of Poland, and that's why they had to invade Poland in 1939 in a, quote, defensive war, unquote, and that uh, Polish saboteurs were just the uh, spearhead of a Polish, coming Polish invasion. And, of course, a ridiculous notion, the idea that Poland would attack uh, Nazi Germany in 1939 at that stage in German military development is uh, laughable at best. But, uh, anyway, this incident has been... Uh, Celebrated in documentaries and movies, and uh, a staged incident that uh, Germany used as a, a justification for a preventive war against Poland. And um, probably the most noted example um, is uh, of a uh, so called preventive war or preemptive war uh, is the Six Day War in 1967, in June 1967. Because a lot of people don't know that it was actually Israel that launched an attack on Egypt, um, citing an impending threat. And um, the fact that it uh, gets called a preventive war um, is uh, misleading because it, it, it's actually more of a uh, preemptive war. Because in this case, Egypt uh, probably was about to launch some aggression. Then. Uh, this uh, incident also brings up the question of the land conquered by Israel in 1967 war. Um, if they are the ones who attacked 
um, Egypt, then isn't it rather imperialistic for them to claim the, conquered, the lands they conquered from Egypt in that aggressive move? But uh, that's a, a topic for another video, as I like to say oftentimes. And um, the other notable examples of the 20th century also have to do with World War II. We have Pearl Harbor, which the um, Japanese could refer to as a preemptive war because they launched it, or I mean a uh, prevent, preventive war, because they wanted to cripple our uh, capacity to fight a war before anything even happened because they knew certain events were leading us towards a confrontation with them, including the fact that FDR in the United States put an oil embargo on Japan, which would be considered an act of war. So there's a lot more to that story than, <coughs> than many are aware of. And then we also have the, the German invasion of Norway in 1940, and that was a, uh, a uh, preventive war in the anticipation there would be an Allied landing or infiltration from the north in Norway. So Germany had a preventive war there to uh, take over Norway. But one of the most uh, interesting examples to me in the 20th century, and once again associated with uh, World War II, is uh, Soviet and British forces uh, got together and invaded the independent imperial kingdom of Iran in 1941 just to secure the oil fields for uh, the Soviet war effort against Nazi Germany. And Iran was officially neutral, although it was friendly to the Axis powers, but uh, there's really no legal justification for um, Soviets and British to just arbitrarily um, invade Iran. So it doesn't even really compare or qualify as a preventive or preemptive war. It's just an aggression. But uh, over 800 Iranian military were killed. Six warships were crippled or destroyed. 200 civilians killed. And Iran even uh, pleaded for FDR for some relief and, uh, of course, was turned down. And uh, But uh, pretty pretty interesting situation. Another reason why Iran would not trust outsiders, uh, which I would suggest. And then uh, in 1945, as a matter of fact, Soviet Union broke off two sections of uh, Iran. The Kurdish Republic was established in 1945, very briefly, and Azerbaijan um, was broken off from Iran in 1945 and continues as a, as a country today as, uh, after it broke away from um, the Soviet Union. Um, so uh, pretty interesting with, with that bit of history that Azerbaijan uh, used to be part of Iran up until 1945. So those are all uh, examples, 20th century examples of preventive and preemptive war. Because of the moral ambiguities, complexities of this, uh, it, the, these type of wars are not permitted by the UN Charter, but that hasn't kept the United States from uh, justifying um, these preemptive and preventive strikes. And um, I have a lot of mixed feelings on it. One can uh, contest um, particularly in the fact that in, in uh, most of history, the country that uh, invades or attacks another country is pretty much traditionally the bad guy. And for America to be entering into the leagues of countries that have done preventive and preemptive strikes, we join the likes of Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, and Zionist Israel. Not necessarily good company, but uh, I have to acquiesce the fact that uh, in this modern age with rogue states, rogue actors, rogue individuals and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, uh, new questions have to be asked. And I, I don't want to ignore those. I want to be realistic. But uh, all in all, it's a, uh, an interesting uh, uh, concept to consider. And we have to consider it now because, as I say, uh, preemptive, preventive war is now um, fully integrated into, into U.S. foreign policy. And it doesn't look like there's going to be any challenges to that policy anytime soon. And um, we have more incursions coming up because of that. I'm a useful idiot. Don't you be one too.